Hello, welcome, and thanks for joining. My name is Aaron Suzuki. I'm the founder and CEO of Prowess Consulting. Joining me is David Shear, industry veteran and the technical strategist at Prowess. Hi, everybody. We put together a short webcast called the 10 Steps to Enable Trusted Gen AI Created Marketing Content. This is intended to be a set of guidelines for B2B product marketing professionals, but really it's learnings from our own process trying to work Gen AI into our content development process. And the learnings from that were very, very interesting. And we're excited to share those with you today. We're going to start with a short introduction to Prowess Consulting. You may know a little bit about us, but you may know nothing at all. Tell you a little bit about who we are and how it is that we came to undertake this study. The key findings from what we learned and then the process itself. We've devised 10 steps that we think will be very interesting to you. And then we have some conclusions and recommendations to share as well. Prowess is a 20-year-old consulting firm based just outside Seattle. We're right between Microsoft and Amazon, uh, as it turns out. Um, and we primarily serve big tech. So we spend a lot of our time helping organizations launch new products into market, including cloud services, new hardware products, and the like. What really sets Prowess apart is that we have both the technical capabilities of a system integrator and the storytelling ability of a marketing agency all under one roof. So that's given us a unique perspective on uh, content and the way that it's created and who we create it for. We had a goal to start incorporating Gen AI into our content development process. Our expectation, our aspiration was that this might reduce processes from months to days or perhaps even hours because the promise of AI was so great. Um, unfortunately, what we found was it didn't really work the way that we expected. Um, although there were places where we found benefits, overall, it wasn't able to accelerate our processes the way that we had hoped that would generate savings for our clients, both in terms of development time as well as cost. The most important thing, I think, is that there are pockets of benefit, but broad limitations when you use Gen AI, especially in B2B product content marketing materials. Um, and some of those limitations we saw reflected in, in other kind of mechanisms we observe around the industry. David, do you want to elaborate a little bit? Yeah, again, one of our goals was to figure out to what extent would this gen AI technology help us speed up our internal processes? And we do a lot of content development for tech companies. And one thing I thought was interesting was there's many steps in that process. So for those of you who do performance analysis or testing on systems, you might recognize that you might speed up a small part of your overall system, but uh, that may not result in an overall speed up in the overall process. So that MDAS law applies to our processes as well. So speeding up a little bit in an area, overall process didn't necessarily speed up. Another thing is, and we put it in the chart here, but we really found that uh, because we're looking at new technology, uh, and so working with people in roles of, say, product marketing, um, you know, the tools haven't been trained. It's not a surprise, but they don't know what they don't know. So um, it does require, uh, you know, expertise about the topic at hand. If you're doing something from a baseline, a quick social media post or maybe a summary, it works pretty well. But a lot of the work that we had to do is still spending that time looking at the output. One one thing we'll talk about in one of the steps, you know, making sure that the tools that are available do adhere to privacy and confidentiality uh, rules and guidelines is, is really crucial. We did find that at least with the uh, Microsoft Copilot that it uh, met our criteria and requirements for that. So that was good. Um, and then again, some of the work streams, you might be able to get uh, a little bit more output or quicker output if you're trying to do ideation or some early types of, of work. Overall though, the, the 10 or so or 20 steps that we've 
put in place over the years at our company, um, it, it didn't do a good, you know, beginning to end uh, type of solution. So we put together this little two by two um, chart to show that there can be high thoroughness and high excellence from the output from these tools. Thoroughness meaning a lot of the information's there, um, it kind of covers the bases. The excellence is the accuracy, the completeness, the timeliness of that content. And so generally in the upper right, you have better output and in the lower left, less great output. Um, and we've even mapped the roles um, to some of these outputs as well, meaning that more market activation oriented roles are correlated with the, the better output in the upper right and kind of more strategy and core product marketing roles generally cannot encompass um, the capability of, of Gen AI for good output. Um, there are exceptions to this rule. There's a lot more work to do. The tools are improving all the time. But as a general rule, this is what our research uh, uncovered. And we had we've certainly done our share. And what this converges back onto are 10 tasks. We consider them steps, but they don't necessarily have to be done in this order. But 10 tasks to map a process. David, do you want to expand a little bit on what these are? Yeah, I mean... Many companies are definitely looking at these you know, AI, how do you apply it? And so when we went through this process internally, this was an iterative process and we went back and forth. So it's again, not necessarily in order, but these are definitely 10 things to consider that you have to answer these questions. If you're looking at using any, any one of the variety of tools that are out there for the organization. Um, and so, you know, it is broken out into you know, planning this, evaluating the different tools, and then, you know, going into operation. So the first is, um, you know, figuring out a deployment criteria. So um, when we initially said, um, we had a small team and we actually came to Aaron and said, hey, we want to do this. And he's like, great, but we're not going to just roll it out to everybody. So we had to figure out, you know, so what was that criteria? And so things like who, um, what types of jobs or, you know, what training do we have to put in place? The second was scale requirements. So um, a lot of these tools are awesome, kind of as an individual type of tool. So one document, one thing that you're doing, if you want to create an image, you can, you know, you know, use a different model for that as a one person kind of thing. But we deal with many, many different documents and many different steps and types of output. And that's where we ran into all kinds of challenges. Like, how do you do uh, a summary of more than one document? Now, we figured that out, and we can talk about that in another day. But, you know, there are scale requirements in your own organization. Is it just one person to one document, or is it multiple documents to multiple outputs? Um, another one is defining success metrics. I know, you know, uh, our little small team got all super excited about this. Uh, but to keep things under control, um, you know, Aaron was pretty clear about, hey, what are you trying to, you know, uh, trying to do and what would be the success of that, which got us back to the, hey, we have, you know, 10 or 20 business processes and it accelerated only a portion of that. So we were pretty clear about the metrics. Um, in terms of evaluation, there are lots of different uh, tools so we did evaluate things from OpenAI, from Microsoft and other companies. There's also a lot of uh, AI tools that are available that are kind of front ends to these different models. So you have to determine which one might work for you. Um, and then look at your business processes. So you know, one of the things that you'll do is you'll take the tool and apply it to your business process. So if your business processes are well-defined, this step is pretty straightforward. At our company, they have been defined over years. So it was really good to look at, say, the 10 or 20 different steps in creating a piece of con you know, content and then applying the tool to that process and then comparing the output. And then we could determine, did it do a good job? Was it you know, off in the weeds or not do a good job at all? Uh, another big area is addressing risk. So um, this was a big uh, issue about 
what kind of content are we giving to these tools? What do they do with it? Is the tool uh, redoing, um, you know, learning for the models? Because that might violate our NDAs that we have with our customers. Do we firewall all of our projects? Do we, you know, very careful about how we, uh, you know, separate things? So, you know, you have to address the risk for the for your company and what you're doing with that content and where you're putting that information. Along with that, regarding risk is evaluating internal policy as well, right, David? And one of the things we talked about was, in a lot of cases, general policies exist, how squarely they apply to Gen AI and, and using that for content creation internally sometimes is kind of a gray area. So doing the internal due diligence or the, inter the due diligence with your customers or clients, uh, as the case may be, is, is also very important. Yeah, and, and we put a policies and procedures or, you know, in place for people because that was really important. Once we had decided on the tool to use, we had to make sure that people only use that tool because it wasn't open for anyone to use any of the latest tools that are out there for the reasons you know, for confidentiality or security or other other issues and stuff. But we had to do training in that area. Um, once once you figured out the tool and all that, you're going to apply it again to your process. And then what we did is we took our processes and we compared output. So, it was, you know, for us, it was pretty straightforward. We had a history of a project with different outputs. So our team could go through and evaluate when you did that, what would actually could um, work well. Uh, which turned out to be a lot of the front end research kind of stuff, summarizing things, but not final product. Um, and again, a lot of final product stuff has to do with, you know, a tone and style that a, that a large language model is not going to know particularly well. So the customer has a, a particular way to do stuff, but the upfront stuff was very, uh, it could help out a lot. Related to that is uh, the, the relevant prompt. Uh, so there's a lot of documents out there about prompt engineering and things like that. Um, and so we had to internally figure out the prompts that would work for us to get as close to the output that we wanted. And we do spend a lot of time sharing uh, BKMs and, and knowledge in that area. So while the documents out there are really good to get you started, uh, you do have to tune all those for your own uh, you know, output and in, in area that you're looking at. Super critical to evaluate the output. Um, there's lots of articles about this, but you can get crazy output. You know, we found four kinds of problems with output, you know, from we would get uh, in the research phase, we get stuff that wasn't relevant. You're talking about, you know, uh, a processor and you might get something about a, you know, superconductor. Uh, the second area is you get a lot of outdated stuff. That's not a big surprise because we're, we did, tend to work on a lot of new things, but still you can't rely on that outdated info. It could, could lead you astray if you're trying to do something different. Um, it can be quite literal. So uh, it is the explain it like I'm five. You can ask it this, a question and it won't, you know, won't do it, but you ask it a little differently and it'll come back with an answer and you're like, seriously, you know, that's the same question, but you know, when you're five years old, it doesn't seem like it. And the last one, which we did run into is gaslighting. Uh, we had a person who had a bunch of uh, questions in there, got output, they came back and started talking about dragons. And then when, you know, she went back and said, why did you give me information about dragons? It said, I didn't give you any information about dragons. So, you know, classic gaslighting on that one. A fun, a fun collision there of a hallucination and then to be gaslit about it. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, uh, but it really goes to the bigger issue about you have to evaluate the output, which means the person evaluating the output has to be a subject matter expert. So it, you might get stuff that sounds good, especially in the technology area, if it's technical stuff it could sound like it's right but um you know it oftentimes is not right and then that goes to you know where in our company can this tool help you know what kind of job so we we looked at uh, uh, evaluating this for the writers and uh, you know people are creating documents first but maybe the folks that do a lot of the layout or creative it's not as helpful 
Uh, but if you're doing research and stuff, it could be more helpful. So, you know, obviously having the right job is, is really critical. But these are 10 things that you do have to ask, look at. You're going to go back and forth between these. Um, but it's really crucial that you kind of uh, look at all these different things. So in summary, Gen AI really is a tool for individuals and not for organizations. And what we mean by that specifically is based on our research, we were not successful applying Gen AI universally and realizing monumental gains. Incremental gains are possible in almost any undertaking but you have to have subject matter expertise and you have to be paying attention to what's going in and what's coming out. Um, as David said a couple times, these tools can't know what's not yet known. So if you're a product marketing manager talking about a new product or technology, you're going to have significant limitations, but you may have roles that will be able to do very well with this. If you're talking about market activation roles around topics that are known or you're creating derivative content from existing source material, you might get pretty far ahead. But ultimately, no matter what your undertaking is, you really have to pay attention to risk, not only in the tool set you're using, but the way in which you're using it to ensure that it's compliant with your own internal policies and that you should create those policies if they don't yet exist as well as complying with customer, partner, or client policies uh, and the law. So all of that said, we thank you for joining us and welcome you to continue the conversation with us. Email us at info at prowessconsulting.com. We're happy to answer questions or talk to you about your undertaking and see how we might be able to help. Thanks very much for joining.